Hello, welcome. It's time for another fireside chat. So today I wanted to talk about budget gear that is difficult to outgrow. So in my explorations of synthesizers and electronic music production, I've bought a lot of budget hardware, um, mostly synthesizers, but also other related things. And this is kind of my culmination of thoughts of where I am at this point. Um, I've now, at this point, I feel like outgrown quite a bit of it. Um, I've moved into kind of the more mid-tier level of things, and um, I found that a lot of gear I have I just, just sits on my shelf now. I just don't use it anymore. And um, But there's still some of the kind of budget gear that I consider to be the diamonds in the rough, the real gems that continue to have value, that I continue to want to play with, even though I have fancier and more expensive things now. Um, these Everything I'm going to focus on in this video are things that I pull out and I use maybe not every time, but um, I find value in them every time I do pull them out. And uh, there are things that are worth keeping, I'd say, and things that are hard to, you know, render obsolete. So um, this is, of course, my personal journey. I'm only really going to focus on the items that I have purchased and that I have used extensively. Um, I think there are plenty of other things that probably do fit in this category that I've just never used, and so I don't really want to, uh, don't really want to talk about things that I don't know about. So um, to get this started, first of all, we have to define what budget gear means. Well, of course, everybody, everybody's budget is different. Um, I'm going to draw the line at 500 US dollars or less. And uh, that price I'm going to mostly talk about on the used market, because if you're in the market for budget gear, you should definitely be buying used. So um, the first thing I want to talk about, this is one of the, um, one of the original pieces that I got, which is the Korg Monotron Delay. And uh, this is a pretty interesting little one. So I bought this on eBay. I believe I paid about 65 US dollars for it. And um, I have had just an absolute blast with this thing. Every time I play with it, I love it. It's so much fun. Um, this is one of these things where I think the, uh, what it brings to the table is just a certain sound quality and a certain kind of effect that you get out of it. Um, what it does not bring to the table is a great workflow um, or features. <laughs> it, it has a, a pretty pretty slim pickings in terms of features, um, not least of which being power. Um, you can only power it with two AAA batteries, which is really annoying. So if you are going to actually use this seriously in a musical context, I'd recommend getting the whole MyVolts um, USB converter kit thing for it because um, the, nine, the, the AAA batteries will die on you while you are using it. Um, which it does actually, by the way, make a very cool sound if you're recording while the batteries die. It's kind of cool, but you probably don't want that to happen mid mid performance, right? Um, but ultimately, what the the monotron delay is, is it is a synthesizer, um, so it has a monophonic oscillator inside it. The only way to play it is through this touch keyboard, uh, this like touch strip thing, which is not very good um, and very difficult to calibrate. Um, there is a mod to make it respond to CV. I haven't done that on mine. Um, but ultimately, I kind of ignore the whole synthesizer side of it. Um, it's there if you want to use it, um, but it's not really the focus of it for me. The focus of it is two things. One, an analog filter. And uh, this is a very dirty, gritty kind of filter. Um, reminds me of like the MS-10, MS-20 kind of style. And um, you can pass any other audio through it. It has an audio input port on the back pass audio through it, um, through that filter, and then you just, you know, have a nice uh, characterful analog filter to apply to whatever other synths or sounds that you are messing with. Um, so I really like the filter on this, um, and, you know, it's, it's easy. It does not have resonance, or does not have separate resonance control, unfortunately, but um, just, you know, controlling the, the cutoff um, is kind of all you, all you get, and it's kind of all you need. Um, it does also have this delay effect, and this is, again, an analog delay and um, the delay has feedback and between the interplay of those two the analog filter um, controlling the cutoff and then controlling both the time and feedback uh, mostly the feedback controls of the delay you can get some really really kind of grungy gritty gnarly dirty sounds out of this thing i really love it um, so for me the the ideal use case for this is to take what would otherwise be a really clean, maybe kind of like a too clean, too pristine type sound, like from a digital synth, for example. Um, and then you want to add some grit and character and dirt and kind of fullness to it. Run it through this, uh, you know, for 
under 100 bucks, 60, 80, however much you end up paying for it. Um, no, I, I take it back. The actual price of this thing is supposed to be $60. I actually paid 35 US dollars for it because this one is damaged. It, there's like some scratches in the trackpad. So yes, I got a crazy good deal on it. But anytime I've looked it up, it's usually around $60. So um, yeah, for any, kind of any amount of money um, under $100, I would say if you, if you really like that dirty, gritty analog sound um, and you want just something that gives you that, uh, even from, uh, from a laptop, like let's say you're working purely with VSTs, and you just want to run all your digital sounds through something analog and then record it back in, well, this will, this will do that for you for real cheap. Um, super fun. Love it. Um, I definitely wouldn't ever consider selling it. Also very compact, portable, obviously. Um, the power thing is a bit of a pain, but once you get the USB thing, you're good. So that wraps it up for the Korg Monotron Delay. By the way, there are other options in the Monotron series. Um, I don't think any of them are nearly as interesting as the Delay. Um, so feel free to look into them yourself, but the delay is the one that uh, really is the, the gem for me. So the next thing that I want to talk about is, um, it's actually related, it comes from the same lineage. So the, the Korg Monotron delay, um, that whole line kind of evolved into the Korg NTS-1. And the NTS-1 is, um, you know, see similar in size, very compact. Um, it's a assemble it yourself kit. I wouldn't really call it DIY, but you know, you just screw it together following the instructions. And, um, and of course, if you buy it used, it's probably already going to be assembled. And so um, it's, it's a similar kind of concept where it's a monophonic synth um, with built-in effects, but it takes that concept way further. So first of all, this one is purely digital. There's no analog side to it whatsoever. Um, and so you're not going to get the same kind of analog sounds out of it. And the other major difference is that while it does, you know, have audio in and you can pass things through, you can only pass audio through the effects and not through the filter, which is kind of a bummer. Um, I do wish you could use this as a filter for external gear. You cannot. Um, but uh, what it can do is it can load custom oscillators on there, meaning it comes with a whole bunch of oscillators. And then also you can load oscillators that other people have written onto it. And that includes, um, you know, some kind of very classic well-known things like plates, um, as well as all kinds of random quirky things that people have made. Like, for example, somebody made a full emulation of the Volca bass inside the NTS-1. So if you're thinking about the Volca bass, you can get kind of a two-for-one with this one, which is kind of, kind of interesting. Um, and then so there's things like that. And there, there's also just some really good quality oscillators. A lot of them are free. Some of them cost money. So depending on, you know, if you spend money on those, you might end up putting some more money into this ecosystem. But um, it's, they're, they're definitely worth it. And um, for me, where this also shines, like the oscillators are cool. Um, they sound great. And I definitely use them sometimes. But where I use this one almost all the time is for the effects. And so you have three different categories of effects, mod, delay, and reverb. Mod can kind of mean anything. It's modulation effects, but so it's stuff like chorus and um, ensemble and phaser, things that are kind of fairly common. Um, but, you know, when people write their own effects in for that mod slot, it can really be whatever, whatever the designer thinks of. Um, delays and reverbs are those. And I would say the, the quality of the built-in ones are good, but the quality of some of the external ones that I've loaded on here are excellent, really, really excellent. Um, I keep meaning to, at some point, I will make a video specifically on all the Log SDK stuff um, that's compatible with the NTS-1, as well as the, um, the Mini Log XD and the Pro Log, all in that same series from Korg. Um, the whole Log SDK ecosystem is really, really, really cool. And if you are a programmer yourself and you want to get into that kind of thing, well, this is designed to be a platform for that. Um, this one is USB powered, so in terms of power, it's a lot simpler. The downside of that being that you will definitely get ground loop noise off of it. Um, all USB powered synths kind of have this, uh, this problem or this challenge. My solution is I just always power it from a little dedicated USB battery and then it's never a problem. That means that you cannot, like if you try to use this as a sound source while plugged into a computer, like for example, say you're trying to use your DAW to sequence this over MIDI, over USB, you're going to have noise out of it. It's going to be a problem. Um, it does also have analog MIDI. Um, in this case, it's the um, eighth inch, so you, you need those TRS to MIDI adapters if you're coming from a full five pin. Um, type A is what it uses. So that's a workaround for that. Like if you want to sequence this from a DAW, 
um, you're going to probably want to use a 5-pin MIDI and then um, convert it to the TRS style, and then you won't have any of those noise issues as long as you power this separately from your computer. So be aware of that. There are noise issues with most USB-powered things, including this one. Um, other feature it has, which really is kind of a, I think, kind of an unsung hero of this, is the ARP. Um, the built-in arpeggi arpeggiator on this is really good. It's actually really deep. There's a lot of features that it has. You can have it, um, you can tweak it to be on different scales. Um, you can have it do just like simple things like octaves and fifths. Um, it's, uh, I mean, certainly I've seen better ARPs out there, but like for the price and for how it's all built in here, it's pretty darn good. The ARP in this um, is no joke. And in terms of the touch strip keyboard, you know, I'm not a fan, but I never really use it. I always plug it in with an, a bigger external keyboard and play it that way, or I sequence it from some other piece of hardware. Um, so for me, that's not a big deal. The other issue I will mention with this um, is the, the build quality at being this little kit. It's meant to be, you know, for developers. Like, it's really not very rugged. Um, if you're looking for something to take on the road or to travel heavily with or frequently plug in and plug out, it's not great for that. Um, it's just not very sturdy. A lot of people, myself included, have had problems with the jacks breaking over time. Um, and uh, so that can happen. If you know how to solder, it's pretty easy to fix. In my case, I had one break and I got it replaced under warranty. Um, so you do have to be a bit gentle with it. Um, but that said, for the features it packs in there, for the price, it's absolutely incredible. And in terms of the idea of like, it's difficult to outgrow, well, um, like I said, for me personally, I. I wouldn't say I've outgrown the oscillators, but I don't use them that much anymore because I just have other synths with other oscillators that I prefer to use. But what I do use this for all the time is for effects. If I want just a really nice, um, characterful, kind of beautiful reverb, I reach for this. Um, the Specifically the Hammond Eggs reverbs, I just, um, Cathedral is my favorite of all of them, but like they're all really good and um, they're just fantastic. The delays also, um, some really interesting delays that are available for this. And um, the fact that you can just pass anything through it um, is really helpful. And so the way I often use this is I will set this up as a um, send and receive or send and return on my mixer. So I will use this as a send effect on all of my other synths that are passing through my mixer. Um, you can also, of course, just pass a single synth through it and I mean, they're cheap enough that you could buy one per synth <laughs> if you wanted like a dedicated effects box for each of them. Um, it also has the Korg sync standard, which is used on Volcas and the Minilog XD and a bunch of their other stuff, which is definitely handy. That's like an audio pulse sync um, that works with a bunch of different stuff. Um, so it has just a lot of, a lot of features and for, um, for the price, $100 or less, I mean, it's $100 new, so used should be less. Um, it's really, really darn incredible. So I, this is like, if you're just starting out, you're buying your very first piece of gear and you want to just kind of dip your toes in and make sure that hardware is even worth it for you. And you want something that's going to be, uh, good to play with on its own, but also something that's not going to just kind of become obsolete as soon as you buy the next bigger thing. I, I think the NTS one is what I recommend to pretty much anybody. I've had so much fun with just this and a keyboard and nothing else. Um, it's really just fantastic. Um, the primary things it's missing compared to other things in this category is there is no internal sequencer on this. Um, so if you want to sequence it, you have to use something external for that. Um, but you can just use the ARP kind of like a, a basic sequencer, um, you know, play it at a really slow tempo, have it do octaves or whatever. I mean, you can, there's ways you can kind of get a sequencer type of thing out of it. Or there's certain of the, the Log SDK software you can load on it that does have, that brings the sequencer to it. So for example, I mentioned that Volca Bass emulation that emulates the Volca Bass sequencer, which is actually three separate sequencers. So it is actually possible to add a sequencer to this through some of these soft, the free software kind of upgrades um, that, you can, that you can load on here, but out of the box, it does not come with one. So um, in my opinion, that's a very minor very minor point. Um, and uh, my the other biggest issue I, th I have with this one personally is that there's no way to set the, the volume or the level of the oscillator um, separately. So um, what that means is that if you're using this as a send effects off a mixer or at the end of your effects chain, like I like to do, if you also want to use this oscillator, um, it means that oscillator is probably going to be way too loud in the mix and there's no way to turn it down. 
the only way to turn it down is to turn the entire unit's volume down. And that's a problem. Um, my workaround for that is just to use the filter. So I use the filter on the oscillator and filter out most of that. Um, but of course, filter is not the same as level or volume. So um, that is definitely, I think, a significant issue if you want to use this as an oscillator and an effects unit um, for external gear, kind of in the context of a bunch of other stuff, it can be a problem. And so that's the point where, like I said, in my workflow, I've kind of outgrown it as an oscillator, but I do still use it as an effects unit. And um, it's, uh, it's incredibly useful just as an effects unit, even if you pretend the oscillator doesn't exist. So yeah, Korg NTS-1, if you're gonna get anything I'm talking about today, you're only gonna get one thing, I would suggest this is the thing. Okay, so next up, we have the Korg Volca drum. And I will say, um, I haven't used all of the Volcas, but I think I've used about half of them at this point. Um, and by used, I mean I've owned about half of them and I've used them extensively. And um, I will say that the vast majority of the Volcas are easy to outgrow. Like they, um, for all of the ones that are kind of like just a synthesizer or just, you know, a sample player or whatever it is, um, they, they kind of do their thing, you know, they do it well enough but as soon as you kind of get up to a higher level, a higher tier of gear, you're probably not gonna rely on them very much anymore. You might still pull them out as a novelty because they're fun and they're fast and like, you know, they're, they're still fun to play with. But um, in terms of the sounds that they bring to the table, I think they're, they're definitely, you know, replaceable. Um, now, in terms of the Volca drum, I would say this is the one so far that I think might be the exception. Um, I'm thoroughly impressed with this. Now, it is the most recent in the Volca line at the time of this filming, um, and uh, it has definitely the most features of any of the Volcas. Um, for example, the sequencer in this, it's still only 16 steps, which is frustrating, but it can do um, per step parameter locking, uh, which is a huge feature. Um, it can do... Um, you can load separate um, kits and programs, meaning that you can write a sequence and then try a bunch of different kits on that sequence to see if like some other sounds jump out at you, which is a really cool feature. The randomization feature is really cool. Um, and let's back up a little bit and talk about kind of what it is. So, um, you know, they say it's a digital percussion synthesizer. And um, I've heard some people say like, it should be called the Volca Perk instead of the Volca Drum. Um, cause I would, and I kind of agree with that because it's, um, compared to the other Volcas, um, there's other Volcas that are kind of like better as a dedicated drum machine, I'd say like, um, like the Volca kick is a dedicated kick. Um, Volca sample is kind of the better, better for just being a generic, like any kind of drums you want. Um, and, uh, but the, what the Volca drum really brings to the table is designing from scratch your own percussion sounds. Now that can include, you know, um, kick sounds and stuff like that, but where this thing really shines is in its kind of higher frequency percussive sounds. So stuff like, um, you know, hi-hats and rim shots and even claps, um, stuff like that, kind of all, all the other kind of like filler drum sounds that you use to make a pattern more interesting. Um, now that said, there's nothing wrong with the kick sounds you get out of this. Um, but I would say that like, if you're, if you have something else you already really like for kind of your, your basic kick and snare patterns, you might stick with that and then use the Volca drum to bring in all the other interesting stuff on top of that. It's really good for that kind of thing. Um, it has two layers of FM synthesis. Uh, so it is an FM synth and each one of these six tracks, uh, on each one of these six tracks, you can play up to two layers of synthesis. And the idea is that it's simulating um, the, the impact of like when the drum stick hits the drum and then the, the ringing out of that sound within the drum body. And so you get, uh, you can kind of do whatever you want with it, but the idea is that you can simulate, you know, that, that initial transient and then the kind of longer sound if you want there to be a longer sound. And that's, that's really powerful to be able to layer two different sounds like that because it's really up to you, you know, if you wanted to have two really quick transient sounds layered up, you could, or two really long sounds or mix and match. Um, and so there's a whole lot you can do with that. So in terms of sound design depth, I think the Volca drum 
probably has the most depth of any of the Volcas. And I mean, it has more depth than a lot of far more expensive synthesizers as well, especially other kind of dedicated drum synths. So um, it's it's pretty impressive, all the sounds you can, you can eke out of this. Um, I do also really like it for bass sounds. It's not like my go-to thing for bass sounds, but if it's, if it's all you had for that, definitely you're not going to be disappointed. Um, in my opinion, FM synthesis in general is just great for bass sounds, especially those kind of full round uh, bass kind of things that fill, really fill up the subwoofer and like kind of, you know, hit you in the chest. Those kind of sounds are great. So I really like the Volca drum for the range of sounds you get out of it, um, its synthesis capabilities. And then the, um, the effects section on this, um, it's a send effect per track, which is amazing. And um, it's this uh, kind of physical modeling approach uh, they call the waveguide resonator, where the idea is that you can simulate as if you were sending that sound through a string. Um, and you can play with things like as if you were tightening and loosening that string. Um, or if you were sending it through a tube um, and you were changing the properties of that tube, like the width of it and the length of it and things like that. And that's a really interesting approach to effects in general. And, um, you know, getting that off of something so cheap uh, is really cool. And so basically it means you can take any one of these like sounds that you've made that are already very interesting and run them through a very good quality effect. Um, it's kind of, the effect is kind of unique. I'd say it's closest to a delay effect and you can definitely use it just kind of like a tr traditional delay if you want to, but it's more like combining delay and reverb and kind of some resonance all into one. Um, it's just kind of its own thing. And that uniqueness of the effect you get out of this, I think is one of the reasons why it's hard to outgrow it. Because there's very few things out there, especially in the hardware realm currently, that do that, um, that have that kind of, that type of approach to sound. Um, like in terms of the sounds you can make with the oscillators, you can definitely make a lot of those same sounds with other gear. But the waveguide resonance, I think, is what makes this thing really special. And also, um, you know, if you're just into the vocal sequencer in general, I think this it's the best example of that out there. Um, you know, and you have six tracks to work with. It's not just a single track like a lot of the other vocals are. So um, so really, it's, it's kind of got the whole package. Um, definitely, there's some downsides. Um, and but, you know, for the, for the price, um, I I paid 89 US dollars for this, uh, which is, again, a steal. I think it's worth a double that. Um, but uh, it's, it's been really fantastic. Um, downsides I can think of, um, all of the Volcas are a bit noisy. Um, in my opinion, not a big deal, especially not from this, because I'm not using this for pristine sounds. I'm using it for kind of more interesting textured characterful sounds anyway. So my opinion, not a huge deal. Um, the Volca sequencer in general is very limiting. I still prefer to sequence this one externally. So I tend to use it more like a sound module and not like on its own as much. But if I do want to just grab this on the couch and mess around with it on its own, I always have a great time with it. Um, the sequencer can do like ratchets, meaning uh, slices. So it can do kind of micro timing ratchets, which is amazing. It can do accents. Like you can really write some very complex drum patterns just with this sequencer. And you can chain um, your patterns as well. So you can make longer than 16 step sequences if you chain them, but there's no way to save those. I don't think, is there? No, some of the Volcas have like a song mode type thing where you can save those. I don't think this one does, but um, uh, but regardless, I don't really use this sequencer much anyway. I use it as a sound module and I sequence it from something external. And I think um, that's my recommendation for all the Volcas. And um, definitely if you're gonna get any of the Volcas, I would say the Volca drum could easily be your first and maybe last Volca. <laughs> um, it's just, uh, it's, it's got a lot to offer for the price. So uh, you may notice these first three options were all from Korg. Um, and partly that's because I have kind of a predilection to Korg. I really like their gear and I've just bought a lot of it. Um, and I think they've, they've been playing in the space a lot of budget gear and like getting a lot out of budget gear. And like I said, a lot of what they've um, put out, you know, I'm not, a, including in this category. I own a bunch of other Volcas that I'm not listing here because I think a lot of the Volcas do um, kind of wear thin after a while. You do outgrow them. Um, but these particular things I've highlighted, the Monotron Delay, the NTS-1, the Volca Drum, um, really, really each one of them I think is a gem in its own way. Let's move on um, to the next 
item I have here. This is the Electron model samples. I have made a ton of videos on this thing already, so I'm not gonna like go into all the features and stuff because I've kind of already done that in other videos. If you're really interested, if you're really seriously thinking about buying this one or if you want to already own it and you want to learn deeper about how to use it, watch my other videos. I've done a lot of deep dives on this thing already. Very briefly, I will say, um, you know, it's a sample player, meaning it doesn't sample directly, but you load stuff onto it over USB. Um, the software works great for that. One gig internal sample memory is capacious compared to most other things out there in this price range. Um, it's plenty to work with. The way that the model samples really holds its value for me is two things. One is, is the physical form factor. This portability, this kind of like uh, kind of rounded plastic um, sturdiness, like it's really easy to slip into a backpack and take it. I've taken this to the beach, I've taken it traveling, all that. I never regret bringing this thing with me. It's really easy to power. You have two different power options, um, both of which actually can be USB power if you get the right cable for it. Um, and so I usually power this from a USB battery um, or it comes with a wall adapter, of course, as well. Um, and then it also has the, the analog MIDI over 8th inch TRS. Um, this does both TRS type A and type B, which is hugely beneficial if you're inter interfacing with other gear. I don't know of anything else that does that, that can just switch, they call it polarity, but you can switch between type A and type B, super useful. Um, and then of course your, your main outs and your headphones out. So I think that the way that I find the model samples to hold a ton of value and the way in which I find it difficult to outgrow it is uh, not so much in its use as a drum machine, because there are definitely more powerful and better drum machines out there. Um, likewise, a sampler, you know, there's definitely better samplers out there. Um, but the way that I find it really, really interesting and useful is as a, a synthesizer. And so basically it has six different tracks. Each one of them is monophonic. And each one of those tracks can very quickly and easily be turned into a synth, um, a wave cycle or wavetable synth. And I've made other kind of deep divey tutorial videos about this if you're interested in this. But the idea is that you can think of this as six different monophonic synthesizers in one unit, uh, which is huge. Um, that's, that's a lot of power. And so if I, for example, I could take all six of those, layer them up as like one huge fat unison voice, you can do that. Um, or I could detune them, right? I could, have, uh, I could have it play, you know, big kind of six note chords um, off of like pressing a single key, which is pretty interesting. Um, the six tracks also line up very well with the Volca drum, which also has six tracks. So I will frequently use the model samples to sequence the Volca drum, and I will layer the sounds on top of each other. So instead of just having the two FM layers from the Volca drum, I'll have three layers, two FM plus one sample. And so then you get into this territory of like combining synthesis and samples together um, to kind of make your own new custom sounds. And so I think that's a really powerful combo, these two. Um, but the, uh, yeah, even just the model samples on its own, you know, I love it for its portability. Um, and I love it for its, it's really a very deep well of sound design and sound shaping capabilities, as well as one of the best sequencers, you know, out there. Like, yes, it is a monophonic. This is not going to be your solution for chords and polyphony, most likely. But, um, but for tons of styles of music, that's really not a problem. And so um, this really, you can go very, very far with it. I've made a ton of videos on this. Um, I've used this kind of as the central brain for a whole bigger setup. And I have a whole series on that called the Electron Workstation in how powerful this thing can be as a brain for a much bigger setup. Um, so definitely if this is kind of in your, your price range and your budget, I mean, uh, I think brand new, you know, these are 300 used. The typical used price is about 250. I've talked to people that have gotten this for 200 us dollars and if you're patient and you find one for 200 dollars like that i can't think of a better value a better way of spending that amount of money like that's an incredible amount of power for that relatively small amount of money so um that's uh definitely the model samples is a massive um massive value in my view um by the way it doesn't look like this by default i have an overlay on it that adds all these colored boxes and stuff to it to me, that visually helped me learn it a lot. Um, I really liked it. Um, that overlay cost $30, I think 35 something like that. Totally worth it in my book, um, up to you. Tons of people ask me about it. I always comment, it's from oversynth.com if you wanna look at their overlays. 
it's an option. Um, and of course you can put stickers and stuff on it too, if you want. Um, but yeah, definitely model samples. One of my go-tos for kind of everything, you know, I find myself using it less and less as I now have fancier gear, but it's definitely, um, something where I, well, I'll talk about to that for a second. Like in the idea of it becoming, um, you know, me outgrowing it as I get better gear in the future. Well, the thing I keep coming back to this for is, um, hi-hat patterns. I really like this. If I, if I have a whole table full of stuff and I've got other things I'm doing most of my drums on, I really like using the model samples for hi-hats because the retrig function is so quick and so easy. And I like making these kind of complex, um, morphing generative hi-hat patterns off this. So, um, I think it stands really well on its own, but even in the context of a bunch of other stuff, I find it to be great as like a dedicated hi-hat machine, um, or as a dedicated wavetable or wave cycle synth either way just fantastic. So can't say enough good things about this one. Um, the downsides really kind of the only downsides I can think of one, definitely the build quality is not as good as more expensive gear, but for its price, I think the build quality is fine. Um, these buttons on mine, those small ones across the bottom, sometimes when I press them down, they get kind of stuck down and they don't pop right back up like it's happening right now. And I have to kind of mess with it for a minute to get it to pop up. That can definitely be annoying. Um, and then also well-documented the, um, these velocity sensitive drum pads are just way too hard. They're really hard to play in a finger drumming type way. I've evolved to just treat them as track selection pads. I don't really drum on them. Um, once in a while, I will play with the modulation settings to use them as pressure pads where you like lean into it and you use that as a modulation source for some other parameter. And that's pretty cool. That's something that's a unique feature. Um, I think if they called them pressure pads instead of drum pads, we would all be a lot happier. <laughs> but um, so if you kind of shift your perception of them a little bit, they're not that bad. But if you're looking for a finger drumming experience, you're not going to get it out of these. You're going to want to use an external controller for that. And that's what I do. I use an external drum pad controller with this if I want to use it for finger drumming. So um, but other than that, I mean, the screen's like fine. It's not amazing. But again, this is budget gear. Like you're not going to get the best screen off this. So um, I think it's I think it's pretty fantastic. Um, super flexible applicable to a ton of different styles of music because it's samples and you can make it sound like whatever you want. Um, you're not kind of as pigeonholed as a lot of these other things that are, you know, really kind of more geared towards maybe techno or hip hop or EDM or whatever kind of specific sounds that they make. You know, the model samples can literally sound like anything you want. Um, I would love to see some like, you know, bluegrass folk bands using sample players like this. I don't know if they do, but it'd be cool, right? So. There we go. There's my thoughts on the model samples. Um, now, of course, Electron has a whole, you know, bunch of more expensive gear. I think all of it's pretty amazing. I'm pretty into the whole Electron thing, and I have a lot of their more expensive things too, but I find the model samples brings a ton to the table. Um, by the way, I will also mention the thought of combining these two. I think they're really fun as separate things, but if you want both of these smashed into one unit, well, that's kind of what the model cycles is. The model cycles is these types of sounds, FM drum sounds in this form factor with this sequencer. And arguably the model cycles is better than these two. Um, I mean, certainly it's cheaper than buying both of them. Um, the Volca drum still has that waveguide resonator that's unique that the model cycles does not have. And the model samples is more versatile and flexible because it's not just FM drum sounds. It can do a ton of other stuff too. But just to point that out, I think the model cycles is also a really compelling option for a lot of people that want, um, that really love those sounds and they want something that's, you know, more of a traditional synth where you're not having to load stuff on there and do sample management and stuff like that. So uh, we've talked about Korg, we've talked about Electron, uh, both of which are, you know, relatively large companies in this space. Uh, let's now move to the Dreadbox Typhon. Now, um, Dreadbox is definitely one of the smaller companies in this space. And um, I think that's uh, part of what makes the Typhon really, really impressive because a smaller company means they're making more boutique kind of things. And um, that generally means, you know, they don't have the, the scale to make them cheap. Um, and it's, it's really impressive what Dreadbox has been able to do to bring this kind of to the market um, for, I think, not, you know, a very affordable price. So this one, um, I think, usually is around... 325 to 350 um, 
I think that's I, I think that's both new and used. Like it doesn't really depreciate that much because it's just a really good synth. Um, so I think that's about what I paid for it. I don't remember exactly three fifty or so. I think is what I paid. And um, so what it is is it's it's a mono synth, um, an analog subtractive monophonic uh, synthesizer. And um, it in terms of just it being, you know, a mono synth, it sounds absolutely fantastic. Um, it's I think one of the best, uh, well, I would say it's certainly the best, um, you know, analog mono synth in terms of sound quality in this budget category. Um, and I would say it rivals a lot of the much more expensive synths as well, just in terms of the sounds you get out of it. It's really, really, uh, if you just kind of want that classic analog fat beefy sound, like it really does that very well. Um, but it also has a lot more, um, depth to it compared to other, you know, mono synths that you might be looking at. So um, has a fairly kind of traditional design in that there's um, two oscillators. Um, one thing that's kind of unique is that instead of it being a sub oscillator, the second one is actually a super oscillator. It goes above. And so you, you have whatever you tune your main oscillator to, the second one you can tune it to be, you know, up to two octaves above the regular one, which is kind of the opposite of most mono synths. Most mono synths you have your main oscillator and then that you tune the sub oscillator down so that's kind of a just a backwards way of thinking about it but I mean it's it's great though it sounds really great and so you can do kind of the classic things of like tuning the second one to be at intervals separate like a fifth or an octave or whatever um, and that all sounds fantastic you can also kind of smoothly interpolate or sweep between those which is really fun um, this big central knob is for selecting your waveform and so it has you know classic wave shapes like um, square and, and sawtooth um, has a super saw um, but one of the more interesting things that it brings to the table is the FM option so in addition to being an analog subtractive synth it's also an analog FM synth which means that one of the oscillators um, modulates the other one and um, you get into a lot more kind of weird interesting territory with that and so that's a big part of how the soundscape that this produces is just more vast than a lot of the um, the other analog mono synths you might look at, especially in this kind of more budget category. Um, the filter sounds fantastic, um, and it does you know have resonance, separate resonance control. All the amp stuff is great. Um, the I really like that you have these kind of sliders on it. Um, you know they're pretty small, but you get used to that. There's just um, definitely a the good thing about having a bank of sliders like this is that you can move them together in ways that you can't really do with a bunch of knobs. So having things like um, your ADSR on these sliders, for example, is really, really nice because um, you can have things slowly morph and move together. Um, I really like that. I like that it's not pure knobs. I like that it's a mix of the knobs and the, the sliders and the faders. Um, in terms of kind of the menu system, it's really well laid out. It's very obvious. It's kind of easy to jump around. Um, it's, uh, so it's, it's really, I would say it's not really, it's not terribly menu divey. The one weird thing is that you use one of the sliders to kind of select which parameter you're controlling with the rest of them. That's a little weird or different, but you get used to it quickly. It's not a big deal. Um, the screen on it is fine. Again, we're in the budget category, so the screen's not going to be like amazing, but it's fine. Um, all the input and output's great. You got full size MIDI on it. It is USB powered. Um, and yes, you can get some noise from it. Um, again, any USB powered thing you can. I found this one to not be nearly as bad as other things. Um, I do still tend to power it from its own dedicated battery just to make sure there's no issues whatsoever. And I have had ground loop come from it if I'm plugging it into a bunch of other stuff. But um, in general, it does seem to handle it a bit better than other things, um, but it's still a potential issue. Um, and then the other thing that I really love about it is it also has an audio input port. Now, the input is mono only. It's not stereo, which is kind of a shame, but that's okay. Um, you can pass any audio signal through it. And what's really cool about this, like as compared to, say, you know, the NTS-1, I mentioned earlier with the NTS-1, you cannot route the audio through the filter. Um, on this one, you can. And in fact, on this one, you have to. <laughs> I don't think there's a way of bypassing it. Um, which uh, is really cool if you want to use whatever audio source you're passing through it to add to your oscillator 
sound, like we on these previous synths, we talked about kind of layering different oscillator sounds to make a more complex tone. Well, this can do that um, by adding some other third thing through it. And so like in uh, Loopop's video on this, he added white noise from a, a little like, you know, handheld radio through this to bring a noise oscillator in, which I think is brilliant. Anything like that you can think of, you can pass through it. So I will say I've experimented with like passing, like for example, I have a separate drum machine going, passing the entire drum machine signal through this while I'm playing on it. That type of thing doesn't really work that well, at least in the type of music I want to make. Um, so it's really not for like, you're not going to probably use this you know, in like a full effects chain, if you want to use the oscillator part of it, um, but you could. Um, I'll talk about that. This is not really the way I use it, but if, if you wanted to, like let's say you already have, you know, plenty of oscillators, plenty of synths that you like, you don't really need another mono synth. Um, but what you do want is a really beautiful analog filter uh, to pass other things through and a whole bunch of digital effects um, and interesting effects like cloud reverbs and weird delays and stuff like that, this can do that. So you could use it not as a synth at all and only as an effects unit, um, similar to some of the other things I've talked about, like the Monotron delay and the NTS-1. So um, you could you know, use just have one nice, big, beautiful filter knob with resonance for whatever other stuff you're passing through, as well as adding all of the sine vibes effects on here. Um, now the effects are all digital, um, but they're really high quality. And um, there's definitely some unique ones in there like for example one of the effects is a delay where you can change the timing on the left and right channel so again you're taking in a, a mono signal and you're spitting out a stereo signal so it's going to take uh you know your mono signal and duplicate it into the, the stereo left and right field but in one of the delay options in there you can actually change the timing going out of each each side left and right which is really unique and interesting it's not something i've seen elsewhere um, the cloud re, uh, delay, I love, I use it all the time. So it's there's really a lot of kind of depth of the effects in here. Now I will say that's not really how I use it. I mostly use it kind of as its own standalone, standalone mono synth. Um, I came from the Volca bass earlier, and I, I do love the Volca bass too, but I'm not including it in this video because as soon as I got the Typhon, I feel like I did outgrow the Volca bass. And um, the Typhon just does everything better, basically. So. For me, this is one I feel like um, it would be pretty difficult to outgrow because it's such a solid monosynth, as well as having this flexibility of being a really unique and interesting effects unit if you wanted it to be, right? So, um, so like say you start with this as like your main go-to monosynth, and then further down the line you get some big other fancier, you know, Moog or whatever. Um, and you're like, okay, well now this is my monosynth. You can still continue to use this as a dedicated effects unit and you're still gonna get a lot of value out of it that way. So um, definitely the Typhon, um, it's just become one of my one of my favorite synths for sure. Um, I think it just sounds amazing, has a ton of features, great value for the price, really portable, flexible, easy to use, USB power. I mean, I really couldn't ask for more from this thing. Um, so yeah, there you go. And by the way, if you are looking for a more polyphonic version of this, definitely look at the Dreadbox Nymphies as well. Um, it's not included in this video because one, I don't own it, and two, because it is more than $500. But the Nymphies also packs a huge amount of features and punch into the basically same kind of form factor as this. So um, good job, Dreadbox. Your product's definitely uh, very impressive, um, especially for the value and for the price. Okay, uh, last one. It's going to be on this list. Um, I am going to reach for oh, the biggest thing we have here. And that is the Mini Log XD. And now I did do this big other hour long video on my deep dive kind of thoughts on the Mini Log XD. So go watch that if you're thinking of thinking about this one. Um, I'm including it here because it's right on that borderline of $500. Definitely on the used market, you can get it for like 450 or so. Um, and then, uh, but you know, the markets fluctuate. So this is one where you might have to be patient if you want to try to make sure you're getting it under 500. But somewhere in the 450 to 550 US dollars range is usually where I see it selling. And um, there's uh, there's also the version with the built-in keyboard. I recommend this module version because um, the built-in keyboard is just not really that great. Um, I'd recommend an external keyboard instead. Um, the module version is a lot more compact and has kind of all the same features minus the keyboard. So 
this is just a really, really fantastic, solid go-to synth. Um, now, it is primarily a analog subtractive synth, and it's designed to be, you know, pretty simple, pretty one knob per function. I think it's designed to be a lot of people's first, you know, kind of major synth purchase. It was my first major synth purchase, and it's great for learning all of the fundamentals of subtractive synthesis from it. It does also have some kind of more advanced stuff. Um, for example, this cross mod is kind of like FM, uh, so it does a little bit of the analog FM type thing also. Um, but what really makes it unique is the digital multi-engine, which is both um, an oscillator as well as the effects unit. So all of the same oscillators and effects that you can put on the NTS-1, you can also put on the Minilog XD. And in some cases, they can even do more on the Minilog XD. I mean, obviously being polyphonic is a pretty big difference, but also sometimes you just have more layers or whatever. There's more processing power in here, so it can do a bit more. So um, the I would say I tend to use this primarily as a sound module or like a sound design device. Um, I just still don't really love the sequencer. Like sequencer has a lot of depth, but it's only 16 steps and that kind of kills it for me. So I do always use external sequencers with this. But um, in terms of like, if I just want to sit down with an init patch and just design a sound from scratch, especially something where I kind of want those kind of pleasing, warm, round analog tones. Uh, yes, the mini log XD is really, really excellent for that. Um, if I want a, if I want to do sound design where there's just a huge amount of layers of modulation and really complex, the XD is not the best for that. Um, it's kind of limited in what you can do with modulation. There's definitely other stuff that you should look at, um, but none of it's under $500. <laughs> so, um, so there's that. Um, now I will say the, the multi effects engine, the, um, the stuff that comes with it is great, but again, you really need to load on the Logue SDK software in order to make this thing really sing. And there's just some incredible stuff on there in terms of the quality of oscillators, the digital oscillators you can get with this, and then layering those digital oscillators with the analog ones, that's really where this thing shines, as well as the entire built-in effects section. Um, and the effects are all, I mean, I can wax poetic about them in the same way I did with the NTS-1 because they're all the same effects. And so just really fantastic kind of all in one unit in that sense. Um, I'd say, you know, I like to use it with an external keyboard and an external sequencer because that's my preference. Um, but uh, outside of that, it really can be its own kind of contained little thing. And I tend to not pass this through other external effects. I just use the ones that are built in here because they're so good. You don't need anything external. Um, so in that sense, it's really, uh, really kind of easy to work with. It also has some more advanced stuff that I've never used. Like for example, it has CV outs. So you can actually use this to send CV out to modular gear and stuff like that. Um, it's got like damper pedal inputs. Um, you know, there, there's there's things, there's a lot of depth to this actually. And there's, there's certainly a lot of layers of menu diving depth that you don't need, but if you want to go deeper with it, you can. And there's some fancy stuff you can do in there. So um, definitely there's a lot to explore here. And I'm including it in this category of hard to outgrow because um, it's just such a kind of like a dependable workhorse kind of synth where like it's always going to make sounds that um, I want to say predictable, but not in a bad way, like reliable, like sounds that you can rely on. Like if I want, if I'm thinking of this particular type of sound that's not too complex, a sound that's just like a good solid synth sound of whatever variety, chances are the mini log XD can do that. Um, or if I want to get like a good solid kind of bass tone and then layer some interesting on top stuff on top of it with the digital side, you can do that too. So there's definitely a lot you can get out of this. Um, and it's the kind of synth where I, um, I, I find it hard, even though i you know, I do have kind of deeper sound design options in other synths. Sometimes the simplicity of this is exactly what I need. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think this one's definitely has a pretty permanent spot in my studio, obviously a lot less portable and all the other things we've looked at. You can actually still power it from a USB battery with a, a rip cords adapter. And I've done that. So portable in the sense of, you know, carrying it around your house. Sure. You could. Um, and, uh, it's definitely very well built, very rugged and sturdy. Um, I would, you know, I would trust this for, for travel and gigging and stuff. If, if you were going in that direction, um, and yeah, it's just a, just a fantastic synth. So there we go. 
All right, well, I think that's that's my thoughts. So that's everything that I have talked about is stuff that I, I own and stuff I've used about it, used extensively. I think there are a lot more things I could list in here that I haven't used. I've watched videos on and I've read stuff about. Um, I want to, I'll just throw out there, the Arturia Microfique. I'm pretty sure fits in this category too. I just haven't used it. Um, but from everything I've seen, the Microfreak is an amazing value um, for what you get out there. So I think that's definitely one worth looking at. Um, but yeah, I think that this is, that kind of encompasses my thoughts here. So I hope this was helpful. Um, if you're kind of in the phase uh, where you're, you're looking at a lot of budget gear because that's all you can afford and you're looking to kind of get the most bang out of your buck, I think all of these options offer that. When you're buying a piece of gear, look at not only what that piece of gear can do on its own, but look at how it integrates with other things that you might use in the future. And those other things, of course, could be other synthesizers, but it could be just other stuff in general. Like, for example, I like to play with cassette tape gear and use cassettes as a like an effect or make little tape loops and things like that. And a lot of the things I've showcased here play really nicely with tape loops because I can play those tape loops through my effects unit or I can play my unit into the tape loop and back and make feedback loops and stuff like that. Um, so that's an example. Or, you know, maybe you play guitar and you want to be able to route your guitar through some external effects. Well, a lot of these things I've showcased can do that. So um, there's, I think it's, it's good to be cognizant of that, of like, how is this going to work in the context of a larger setup, even if you don't have a larger setup yet? Um, or, you know, also how is it going to work alongside a computer if you like to use a computer to make, to make your music? So I think those are things to think about. And the main things to kind of be aware of there are MIDI connectivity. I mean, everything here I've listed has really good MIDI implementation except for the Monotron Delay. Everything else, though, does MIDI quite well. And you want to have different, it's good to have different options of what physical connectors you have for MIDI. Because if you only have USB for MIDI, um, you will run into, almost certainly, you will run into ground loop issues and noise issues. And it's just, um, it's a pain. You can buy ground loop isolators to get rid of it, but still, it's a pain to deal with. Um, and so it's, I prefer uh, devices that have multiple MIDI options um, or just the traditional five pin MIDI is kind of always reliable. So um, that's one to think about. The other is to think about the audio routing capabilities. So, you know, everything of course is gonna have an audio output, um, you know, whether that's mono or stereo. In a lot of cases, mono, mono is totally fine. Um, you know, most, I think everything I listed here is stereo, but, um, uh, but still, if something is just mono, that's not totally a deal breaker for me. Um, but think about also the, the audio input capabilities, if it has any. And I've, I get a lot of value out of having gear where I can route external audio through it for multiple reasons. One, it's just fun. And I can make different layered sounds. I can, you know, apply these effects to these other sounds and things like that that I've talked about. Um, and the other is you can actually save a fair bit of money in certain setups by not needing a mixer because you don't need to buy the mixer. You don't need to buy all the extra cabling. Um, it just makes things simpler in general. You can get these nice little kind of clean, tidy setups where you have two or three boxes all routed through each other and then out to your recording device and that's it. And I really enjoy those types of kind of um, audio chains and um, things to think about in terms of this, like let's say you have a couple of these items you can take something that has stereo outputs and split that into the two signal paths of left and right and apply different effects to each of those signal paths and then merge them back together later or not, you know? Um, so there's kind of ways, or like with something like the model samples, for example, I've done that where I take like tracks one, two, and three, pan them hard left, tracks four, five, and six, pan them hard right. And now it's like I have two separate mono outputs that I can route into different effects chains. Um, so think about things like that. It's ways of getting more out of budget gear. Um, and you can really go pretty far with this stuff if you, you know, get something and really try to deep dive on it, really try to like, you know, of course, read the manual, um, but also, you know, watch these kind of more tutorial videos. I've made a lot of these deep dive tutorial videos and other people do also. And um, try to like just squeeze every ounce out of the gear that you can. Um, think about hooking it up in ways, uh, you know, that are different. Um, you know, maybe plugging the output of one to the input of another and then making a feedback loop back into the first one again, you know, 
be careful when you do feedback loops with volume, but um, you can make some really interesting sounds that way. So yeah, there's, there's a lot of depth you can get out of budget gear, um, you know, not just based on the spec sheet and the things you have, but thinking about it kind of in a broader context of like, how am I going to hook this up? Um, how am I going to sequence it? How am I going to control it with different types of MIDI input devices? Um, things like that. Okay, so there you go. Um, that's, that's my thoughts on this stuff. I hope this was helpful. And um, if you're out there on the hunt for budget gear, um, I definitely encourage you to take a look at everything I've highlighted here. All of it brings a lot of value to the table, um, a lot of depth, and uh, you can really just squeeze a lot of um, a lot of fun out of these devices. And uh, I, I hope you go forth and make a ton of great music.